Okay, we're going to go on an exciting journey. I'm, I'm going to ask everybody about, the, about their journey of discovery um, because th these guys are discoverers, adventurers. Um, so we'll, we'll start over with, with, with Griffin, a uh, little introduction about what motivates you to be working with EPD labs and to be digging out all the knowledge about Nikola Tesla and, and uh, helping your mentor, uh, um, Eric Dollar, I guess you could describe that. Um, what, what drives you on this journey of discovery? Well, I would say it's, I mean, the overall purpose is that you're given one life, it's best to make the most out of it. So rather than wasting days on end completing really nothing, why not do something worthwhile and interesting that could possibly uncover interesting mysteries of this universe? So working with EPD laboratories uh, really stems from my electrical intuition and overall basis of knowledge and interest from an early age. So EPD laboratories really provides this kind of endeavor, especially into the electrical sciences. And through that, myself and some other colleagues here at the table included, we're able to get some remarkable things done. And EPD Labs is named after Eric P. Dollard. So y you enjoy, rather than looking for new technologies, which you say you have enough of, um, what is it that, that you're enjoying about this journey, Eric? Well, me? I don't know. I'm so tired right now after all this, I can hardly talk. <laughs> I'm really exhausted. Understand. Yeah. Aaron? Um, Aaron Mirakami, who organizes this conference and uh, has, has done so much to, to uh, bring the message out to the world. What motivates you? Well, it's pretty exciting. Um, I think that uh, to do something that somebody thinks is impossible and, you know, to take the uh, established paradigm and blow it to pieces is pretty fun. Uh, that motivates me. I like seeing things happen, not just talk about it. Uh, I enjoy helping to facilitate to see these projects move forward with what we do like here at the shop and with uh, uh, down in uh, EPD labs. Um, you know, seeing something like this come together and the potential of what, what lies there with all the different experiments we can do from possibly the water splitting stuff uh, that we still have to experiment with, you know, running the Trump motor, doing this ground transmission and and all these other kind of things is not being done at this level anywhere in the world that I know of. And certainly if it is, nobody's talking about it or sharing it. And so this group is basically about it. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's a quest for knowledge. You know, when I met John Bedini in 99 before that and everything that led up to that for a long time for me, it, it w there was no idea or intent to like go into business to do anything with this and have my livelihood come from being involved in all this. It was purely a quest for knowledge and that was it. And that still drives me. And if I didn't get that kind of satisfaction out of it, I would have dropped it a long time ago because you know, if you wanna go broke, get involved in the free energy field. Uh, fortunately, I've done you know, pretty well for myself and have been able to fund some of these projects. And you know, being that this is with uh, you know, kind of the core EPD lab group you know, between uh, Nevada and what's going on here, um, I just want to remind everybody that it does take money uh, to make these kind of things happen. And EPD Labs is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. Uh, please donate what you can. We are uh, in need of uh, a good chunk of donations coming in right now to take things to the next step down in Nevada. Uh, EricPDollard.com is the website. You can go to forward slash donate, or I think there's a donate link in the main menu bar. Um, please do a donation by PayPal. That's where most of the donations come from. And there's a little box you can check uh, recurring. If you, $10 a month, you know, if everybody did $10 a month, uh, that's, you know, two coffees from a coffee stand. I mean, uh, but what the good that it's going to is, is it's insanely important. Um, and then, you know, if you want to send a check or money order, send it to the address in Spokane and I'll endorse it, send it down to the bank account. We have, uh, I just had to renew the, the business license and there's you know new insurance that's you know almost triple of what it is for the building and that kind of thing so um, any support is uh, very much appreciated. Um. Thank you. 
I'd, I'd like you to clarify because you gestured towards a rack of equipment and, and the table of equipment and anyone who's watching this who hasn't seen the whole conference would, would like to know what you mean by all this. I mean, you're talking about the experiments that are being done uh, that people have worked on here this spring and all, mm -hmm. all around the year. Could you, could you just kind of sum up what, what experiments um, you've made progress on this year? Um, some is with the, uh, uh, the flame speaker. Um, I heard it about, it about it a long time when I first uh, met Eric in 2013 because he uh, came to the uh, second conference that we did and you know started hearing about these different things about the cosmic induction generator the flame speaker i heard a lot of stuff from peter because he actually witnessed this stuff way back when uh, eric was doing this on a on a bigger scale and that stuff fascinated me and we had a couple people that wanted to get involved and you know there was some money raised and it went to stuff it wasn't supposed to and so i'm thinking well yeah i guess we're just going to have to do it ourselves if we want to see it because nobody else is making it happen and uh, eventually you know we did the little collins uh transmitter demo at the, the fairgrounds a couple years ago. This little 100 watt, you know, flame speaker proved the point. It's real interesting. And, you know, I want to see this thing get gigantic and monstrous. Uh, you know, we made progress this April. And it's not just about, you know, a Adrian's already co covered enough details on the fact that it's not just for entertainment. We're really looking at, you know, life sciences. Uh, how are we, ta wha what's this relationship with uh, us and the ether and how do we use it in different ways and manipulate it. So the cosmic induction generator, that was something I always wanted to see. We started to see the beginnings of that in the last few years at some of the conferences out in uh, Coeur d'Alene where we demonstrated that publicly for the first time that anybody's seen it in, I don't know, 20 years or, w you know, when, when, when it, what, what year was it? Mid 80s. Mid 80s? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that was really the first time anybody in the world has a actually ever seen seen that kind of process publicly. Um, but those were the two that we could do short term, at least with this rack of equipment. Uh, and April was a pretty heavy. D you know, we're going to continue wor working on this to be able to do the experiments when that RF bay is you know at full power with all the intended equipment that's going to going to complete it. Thank you. <coughs> so, as we mentioned before, this group does not only working towards products that people can use for practical, but also some basic science re research going uh, on I here. I like I want to point out, this is not a technological uh, uh, endeavor. It's a philosophical endeavor. And you asked about my motivations or whatever. People ask about that. Then. The only thing I can say is no matter how many times you kick a coyote in the head, it's going to eat chickens. <laughs> <laughs> book, book, yeah, you do what you do, and you happen to be a brilliant electrical genius that there's knows no, more about you know, it. It's not, uh, there's no romanticism involved or whatever. It's a, that's just the species I am. Thank heavens. And from the UK, all the way from the UK, came Dr. Adrian March, Marsh, not only um, but to this conference and previous conferences, but you came in April to work with this team. And would you like to say a bit about y your philosophy of why you're here? Sure. I would very much echo um, uh, what my colleagues have already shared. Um, for me, undoubtedly, all my life, it's been about the quest for knowledge. Uh, and that is really, first and foremost, as I've shared during this conference, is knowledge of the self. So in other words, really finding the reflection of what's inside of me in the work that I do, in the universe around me, with the people that I work with, uh, unfolding uh, group, un uh, group endeavors um, in an inclusive and a life supportive way, working together. I mean, that so came into the work that we did in April. I mean, we did, we did all the work that we had planned in April in the first week because we worked so well together. Um, and then we still had three weeks, and we came up with, with all the kinds of things which led to what we've actually seen at this conference. So it's really, for me, about pioneering the beginning of, of, of that group consciousness, Work, working together um, with the relationships that go with it, um, and that, for me, really underlies um, what the quest for knowledge is all about, the, the new science, the true science. And I also have something to share on that theme that I would like to. This is something that 
um, was brought, to, I'd never seen before, it was brought to my attention um, by my wife and colleague, Irina, um, yesterday. And it's just short, I'll just read it. When a child is born, its sense organs are brought in contact with the outer world. The waves of sound, heat, and light beat against its feeble body. Its sensitive nerve fibers qu quiver. The muscles contract and relax in obedience. A gasp, a breath, and in this act, a wonderful little engine of structure is hitched to the wheel work of the universe. Left to itself, the engine stops. It has no power to draw energy from nature's inexhaustible store. The little engine moves and works, changes size and shape, performs more and more varied operations, becomes sensitive to more and more different influences, and now there begins to manifest itself in a mysterious force. It begins to manifest itself in it a mysterious force. It becomes capable of responding to stimuli of a more subtle nature and of drawing for its own use energy from the environment. Gradually, the engine has been transformed into a being possessed of intelligence which perceives, discerns, does like others of its kind. The experiences multiply, the knowledge increases, the discernment becomes keener. The human being responding to its faintest influences is awakened to the consciousness of nature and all its grandeur. And in its breast there is kindled a desire to imitate nature, to create, to work itself the wonders it perceives. But the exercise of this power does not satisfy the mind, which rises to still higher undefinable perceptions, not of this world, and inspired by them the artist, the inventor, and the man of science, which give expression to the longing of the soul. That was, that was written by Nikola Tesla, December 30th, 1900. Did anyone guess who it was? I didn't know that that expression from him. I'd never read that before. I it was published either. in the New York Herald in 1900. Thank you, Irina. Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> so, Hawker says, what, I, I, I know you've I mentioned you had a I couple of- I think the question was motivation. Robert Heinlein and, and uh, what did, uh, okay, you're a MacGyver guy and Robert Heinlein, what did he say? Uh, it was a long quote from Heinlein. It was essentially a person should be able to program a computer, butcher a hog, give orders, take orders, at work together, uh, act alone. It was that specialization was for insects. Uh, but to answer your question, which was motivation, so there's the esoteric, which is, you know, why are we put on a path? Uh, that one I don't really like, but the, the one I can't answer is why I decided to participate in this and eventually speak in the group was because I spent about 25 years in the fringe sciences, you know, following different, different people and different, building different things, understanding different things, learning every step of the way. And it was only the last few years that uh, I've made a lot of progress sharing, you know, learning from this group. And then I finally realized I had enough. I, I had enough that I could lay a little bit of a breadcrumb trail to hopefully give, you know, my past self or somebody else that's on the same path uh, a little bit of a leg up because I know, like I said, I'm 25 years into this, and I, it's only the last five I really, really started to make progress. So I'd like, I, I it had the responsibility to drop a few morsels to try to get someone up to speed, you know, within a couple of years and not within a couple decades. So, hope that Thank helps. Thank you. Yes, yes, excellent answers here. And, um, but, but one more is, yeah. uh, it's, knowing the fact that it's more like learning a new language. It's not something that you pick up overnight. It's not like you're going to you know, speak fluent French or Japanese. It's one of those things where you do have to have a groundwork. You have to learn you know, nouns and vocab and practice and hours and hours of study. But you know there's something at the end of the path. And you've seen from us that there is stuff at the end of the path. Uh, that was um, John Bernini's thing was telling people enough that they could do it themselves and practice but not give them the whole mm -hmm. recipe because otherwise how would they learn? So they learned by building the machines and um, that's what he wanted. That was, his, that was his aim, was to 
more people doing the building, but um, <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of people um, didn't follow the directions. So they'd say, oh, it doesn't work, but they didn't follow the directions. Now, this whole group, um, example of collaboration, you're all collaborating. We mentioned in the last panel about um, if you had any insights about collaboration by being at this conference. Um, you're, you're doing it, so wh what do you have to say about the value of collaboration? Well, I can certainly add, I mean, we, we, we are going to do some work together after the conference. I mean, and actually we were, we were working out as a result of what we did at this conference. We suddenly came up yesterday afternoon with new ideas. So, in other words, by, by demonstrating it and sharing it with everybody at the conference, it also helped to inspire us with new ideas. So, um, we are now have a plan um, for, for next week of a whole number of things. We already had a plan for some things, but we have some new things in that as well. Um, other people are staying a little bit longer and want to be around in order to see it. So that for me is, is intelligent cooperation, is what I call collaboration. So in other words, we work together intelligently so we all win. And that's not just us that are working on it, but that's everybody wins from that as well. And that for me is the, the heart of what it is that we're really doing together. And I remember you, uh, I talked to you this spring and, and uh, you mentioned that Aaron has a gift. Aaron Marikami can bring people together with diverse backgrounds and ages and interests. And, and here you are working together as a team. So uh, kudos to you, Aaron, you. for that and the progress this team is making. I'd like to just echo that on also because we sat at dinner last night and we went and went, we went a cheers to Aaron and ESTC because if it weren't for you, we wouldn't actually be doing this together. We wouldn't know each other. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Did you have any comment about the collaboration that's happening? Uh, th there's been amazing things that have come out of this conference. I mean, this, this water technology is one of them. Uh, the first conference of 2012 at the uh, Hayden Eagles, uh, Paul uh, Babcock met uh, our friend uh, Dennis. And uh, what, 12 years later, um, you know, this is a reality, uh, this group right here. And, and there's other things kind of going on behind the scenes, you know, but with uh, Jeremiah, I'm looking at this, this uh, Tesla turbine stuff online and uh, I'm seeing two different people and there's a few posts in Energetic Forum and I find out that somebody that seems to be making more progress in it than anybody in the world is, I don't know, three and a half hours drive from me. Uh, it's when Jeremiah was down in uh, Idaho, and then just the way things kind of, kind of happened, and he needed a shop right when we got in here, and so you know we're collaborating, on, collaborating on that, working with Jeremiah to be able to provide this space and the resources and everything uh, to make that Tesla turbine happen. Uh, and the interesting thing is, is that none of it is forced. I've never tried to make it happen with any. I mean, there's an intent to move these things forward. But the synchronicity element is off the frickin' charts. I mean, um, and, and the synchronicities, what Eric calls the voodoo, has been, um, you know, record, record levels just guiding and making these things to come together. If I told you 10% of the stories of just the way that things have been uh, kind of divinely guided and, you know, tweaked in our favor, people wouldn't even believe it. I mean, astronomically impossible impossible things is like the normal course of life for uh, a lot of these projects and how they just kind of come together. So it's, um, you know, so there's something to be said about that. I, I have a comment on Jeremiah's project. I've been around this stuff for a long time because of the Integratron and all that. And uh, for 40 years, I've been hearing about free energy secrets. 40 years. Free energy. I have never seen a bank of light bulbs light up until today. A red letter day. So that's a, uh, how would you say, a transformational or monumental, how, what, when something new comes about, finally, finally. At finally, a practical level. Yeah, it finally, it's something that works. I've been waiting 40 years. Yep. And no secrets. The light bulbs lit up. 
And he didn't start from, like, he wasn't the expert to start here. All, I remember when he first started showing in the back of some of the conferences, just showing off the, the things he was playing with. You know, the Tesla turbine was one of the passions, and it was amazing to see the progress of all of the lessons learned of how to balance and material selection and everything. And it's amazing to see the, the progression year by year, how it's more and more uh, sophisticated and more advanced, and just the fact that you continue to work on it and share what you got. People keep sharing things with you. From cobble tech to mastery. I th <laughs> that's, well, that's the, pro that's the product of what you do when you love doing something. You just do it because it's a path with a heart for no other reason. And when you do it, then it's like, then people start sharing things with you and you get ideas mm -hmm. and it's like, it just starts compounding. It just goes faster and faster. That's the synchronicity that Aaron's yeah. talking about. Yeah, and it's a uh, connection with the Trump machine. Oh, we'll get because there. Because they are an archetypal mate and uh, then all the rest of this stuff is uh, the senseless magnets and capturing the back EMF and all that doesn't have any meaning anymore because now the light bulb's lit up and the Trump generator can take that to the next step. And uh, there is a possibility that the system will synthesize energy, but uh, we don't know until we build it. So, but those two machines need to be married so it's conceivable, but we don't know if it's possible. Well, it was theoretically possible. Yeah. I, I had, you know, postulated that some time back. People did tests that didn't really do it, but um, but this this machine is unique because you have to get it up to the necessary RPM before it performs, and nobody's yeah. done that before. Now we have a machine that can produce those kinds of RPM, and it's quite possible to impedance match that Trump machine to standard voltages and currents and dispense with the magnets once and for all because there's no free energy in magnets and there never will be. Aaron, uh, for the benefit of people who may just watch a panel discussion or something, could you fill quickly fill people in on what they're talking about marrying possibly uh, two different technologies together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of synergy between different technologies. For example, the 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 Trump, you know, motor slash generator can be used as either one. Uh, we got to do the experiment to to run it as a as a motor. But the Trump generator, for example, electrostatic generator, no coils, no magnets, requires high speed vacuum and high voltages, and uh, it'll produce an output that well. According to s some of the Trump papers and MIT and that kind of thing, is it almost sounds like a reactionless generator that can pull load off of it, and there's no dragging down the prime mover. But we got to, you know, test all that out and see it. But even if it is, it's a polar opposite of the motors that we're used to. No yeah. No coils, no magnets. It's a spinning yeah. capacitor, and nobody's really seen that since Trump. Mm -hmm. But to be able to have something that right. you can sit on a wood stove and go tens of thousands of RPM to turn one of these things and take electricity generation to the next level with something like that. It's like the synchronicity of just those two things coming together. I mean, that flea power prototype that I showed last year uh, from Chris Carson, and here I am working with Eric, Chris Carson's uh, you know, deceased. His wife, I think, contacted Peter, who had that generator. Peter brings it to me, working with Eric, and that's been something that has been of interest uh, of his for a long time. And here it is with the optimum prime mover for it. And, you know, with Jeremiah being three and a half hours away out of anywhere, anywhere in the world, he's there. Now he's at the shop and we're doing this. So it's like, do you think I, like, crafted that exact way that it came together? It's so, um, but there's a lot of different synergies between different technologies. But the Tesla turbine and the Trump one is something that, I'm, you know, that's got to happen because... <laughs> You know, I'm to about to jump out of my skin it, it to get that thing it demands, rolling. It demands to happen. Oh, hell yeah. It's got great potential, pun intended. <laughs> and again, to clarify, we're, we're talking about uh, an uncle here. Um, I don't know that Trump's first name. Yeah, so uh, President Donald Trump's uncle is John G. Trump, who um, he was uh, mentored by Van de Graaff at MIT, I think became basically uh, professor or some type of teacher at MIT himself. John G. Trump is one who was called in by the FBI to examine uh, the Tesla papers that were uh, left after Tesla died 
to see if there's any, you know, anything uh, of concern to national security and all this kind of stuff. And he said that there wasn't, but, you know, we're, we're not going to know either way. He lied. There, there's a, you can see it. There's a YouTube video of him being interviewed, uh, and then it was asked, "Well, what did you find? Did you find anything of importance uh, in Tesla's papers?" And then he squirmed and and mm -hmm. fished around, and he lied. He said no, he lied. And it's uh, evident he lied. So he did get something, and then lo and behold, he comes up with the monopolar beam tube like Griffin's building, and nobody else did that. Well, where did he get that from? He got it from Tesla. And then Tesla was gravitating towards a purely electrostatic so-called technology, as much as I hate that word. In fact, I hate technology. But, uh, but at any rate, he experimented, and uh, lo and behold, between uh, Tesla and Trump, there is a electrostatic technology, so to speak. It's ready to start generating electricity. In fact, it, uh, as it was pointed out, that it doesn't even need a substation because it operates at such high voltage, you can just connect it right to the transmission line. And it was meant to operate in space, in the original mm -hmm. idea. Yeah, was in, it in an absolute vacuum where, where it's, then you, there's no ionizations or anything, but but that vacuum can be achieved nowadays, you know, somewhat practically. Mm -hmm. So the, it's basically just time, money, and effort. There's no technical obstacles to overcome anymore at all. Yeah. The technical advances, um, like that have made possible Paul Babcock's fast switching technologies, it's, I, I see it as another sign that our time has come because uh, things are coming together synchronistically. Um, though before we, um, drop the topic of collaboration, or we don't have to drop it. Um, Griffin, I'd like to know what it's, what it's like um, for, for you, 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 ever since you were really, really young, were um, studying and, and learning and experimenting, but what's it like for you now to be part of a team? Well, it's something interesting. I mean, I don't really regard it as anything really special as I'm a fellow colleague as just as anyone here at the table. It's really just more that uh, collectively we are experimenting and finding new discoveries and that we are slowly making breakthrough day by day. It's really all I can. I, I think he's you. a bit like me. There's no glory or romance. It's just that's what the coyote does. <laughs> that's what the coyote does. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could start lining up for uh, questions because I'm sure there's a lot of questions for this panel. Are there? <laughs> Any online? And if we can mention uh, uh, Griffin's website, griffingbrock.com, um, there's a PayPal donate link on his site, and those funds go directly to the experiments that you see uh, posted on his website. So support him how you can. And also, um, he has some of the, uh, those bulbs available, two different types of bulbs. I think there's still some right, available, so right? Right, so I still, I'm taking orders at this point since most of the stock has been sold out. But nonetheless, they are the single wire Tesla filament lamp, which I've been able to perfect over the last couple months. And of course, like Eric had alluded to, the new and improved Tesla radiant beam tube, which I gave a presentation on on Thursday. So I have those for sale at the present and I am currently taking orders. And really the objective of these types of tubes is to get them out into the public for experimenters to work on and find for themselves diff uh, different observations and uncover interesting uh, how should I say, uh, analyze, analyze these tubes really is more than I could really do because this really is a new realm of research that we're barely scratching the surface of. Is that the technology that x-rayed my hand only it wasn't x-rays, it, it was not harmful? Well, yeah, that's what we've found thus far that they're not x-rays. Well, uh, again, I want to emphasize, let's get out of this idea of technology. Uh, that word is so repeated that I think if I hear it again, I'm going to puke up my dinner. It's, n it's not technology. Uh, I, I won't make the statement that I want because we're in public to prefix technology with. But uh, Griffin is not developing a technology. Adrian is not developing a technology. I'm not developing a technology. What we're doing is we're exploring nature and experimenting and learning things. And, and things that can come out of it uh, could be beneficial. Things that come out of it could be very unbeneficial. It can go either way. So, but it's not technology. 
Got it. Okay, can you uh, elaborate on that maybe a bit, Arian, uh, Adrian? Uh, sure. I mean, I mean, if I take um, the, you know the work that we are doing is is exploring fundamental principles in nature. Uh, so it is a it is literally that an ex an exploration of the great mystery. And as er uh, Eric says, we have no idea where that's going to take us. I mean, in effect, we are exploring the vast unknown, and we are only scratching the surface. The and yet, I mean, it was only. Uh, uh, with what I presented here um, so far with my experiments on the world work of nature, I realize um, after that that there is now five more presentations that I need to make. There's <laughs> five more experiments and explorations um, that, that need to happen, even just discussing with my colleagues here. Are they making suggestions as to things that we might explore and collaborations that we might do? For example, one of the experiments that um, Griffin and I would really like to do is to... Um, uh, experiment with the uh, tubes that he has with and put it together with the type of generators that we've been using for the golden ratio discharge which we did a little bit of last year but now the the tubes are so much more further developed uh, we have a better understanding of how uh, the processes work within the, the wheel work of nature experiments that we've done so far so we are really evolving and finding our way um, and really from a from a perspective of research. I mean, we would all like something to come out of it so that we, you know, we, we need resources. We, um, research is very expensive. We have to live, we have to provide um, for, for the situations in our life. Um, and also, you know, it doesn't matter how many things you've got in the lab. When you start a new experiment, you always need something else. <laughs> um, and then gradually the lab grows and grows. I've built four labs over my life and, and I'm amazed that, that every time I start an experiment, um, I always need to something additional in order to be able to do that. But I suppose that's just exploring the unknown. So, so the the support, the donations that we receive, all those kinds of things are pivotal for us to be uh, um, working in the way that we are and exploring fundamental principles. So, in other words, we're not we're not thinking about developing technologies. Uh, this is thing also something that Eric is really saying. We are, we are pioneers in exploring nature's natural principles in the world work of nature, and that is the feeling that we engender together. And if applications come from that along the way, um, the kind of thing Aaron's been talking about and, and yeah. um, Hakasis is working um, with, then that only helps to move us oh. forward, and it also helps the world <laughs> in that so, respect. So the point is, if, if products and things come from that, it's not going to be so we can all drive sports cars and live in a mansion. It's so we can get more research and more stuff to move this along faster. Absolutely. I don't like sports cars. <laughs> I think cars. all of us from that. <laughs> they make too much noise, and they're well, too the glamorous. Well, the objective is that uh, whatever profits are obtained <laughs> siphons itself right back into the work, yeah, it into all the research. Absolutely. And then some. <laughs> I mean, then what good is it? Well, I would just like to add, for example, I would like to take what I've presented with the Golden Dragon um, discharge and the wheel work of nature. I would like to take those things to the next level. I mean, the next level, say, is to move um, to a 10,000 frame per second um, camera, which is the kind of camera the research institutes use to study lightning. Um, so it still has to be, it's no good to be just a, a little online camera. It has to have good quality resolution. Um, at very high speeds at very low light levels. You're talking about a $50,000 camera in order to do that to, um, for, for, for several of our projects. So I would ask that if you know anybody that can help or if you can help or if you can donate um, to even some resources to be able to get that kind of equipment so that we can use it on a day-by-day -day basis, then that is the kind of support um, that will allow us to go to the next level. I mean, Aaron also has application for that with, with, with the plasma work that he's doing. Um, so being able to look deeper into it. I mean, I've, I managed to, uh, I could fund for myself going to 1,000 frames per second. But $50,000 is, is, is beyond what we currently have available for self-funding. And the self-funding, I'll just stay on that, self-funding is so important because it allows us, it gives us the freedom to be able to explore uh, the, the, the research at the right pace in our own way without people trying to take it away or trying to pull strings um, on what we do in the direction that we take. Um, I, I have always, I realized from a very young age that it was necessary for me to self-fund um, the work that I was doing. If somebody, if a benefactor comes along that can help, 
something like that, and I have had plenty of people approach me in the past um, about wanting to support but through monetary resources or, or space or something like that. And, and every one of those, I've always gotten down to ask the question, what do you want in return? And the answer um, has never been very good. <laughs> so I've just rejected it um, because it would take away the true essence of what it is. We are doing pioneering research here. It would take away the true essence of what it is that we're trying to do. So. Thank heavens you're doing it. Okay. Yes, uh, Professor Harlick. Not, not a question, uh, just a comment regarding uh, Tesla's papers. I had the opportunity to talk to somebody who had top secret compartmentalized clearances. All of Tesla's papers are in the National Archive in the top secret section and he has had a chance to go through them. And Eric is exactly right. There's interesting material in it. A lot of the stuff deals with longitudinal waves. And um, maybe at some point it will all be disclosed. Thank you, Professor Harlick. You know, if anyone could do a or fund a video that showed what you were learning about the golden ratio, the discharge and everything, um, you know, with, with special effects and everything. I see what you're doing as a, a really good bridge to the general public, which is my special interest, um, because it, it has the, it, it, talking with you gave me, uh, um, this spring gave me uh, the awe and wonder feeling uh, where the, what you're learning about is so beautiful um, that um, I think I think um, graphically or in video or something would be the w best way it could be presented and and let the general public know that the work you're doing is the new science is exciting it's not just techie stuff it's um, it's beautiful any other questions um, Actually, it's interesting because Eric, um, Eric our, our camera operator here, um, brought um, that similar kind of uh, suggestion to me this, uh, this morning. Collaborations like that, possibly. I mean, it does, it does depend, of course, how that would work. Um, the difficulty that I've found is if you take an expensive piece of equipment and you put it in front of a Tesla call, um, <laughs> thing, it doesn't always work out that well. There's some risk involved. So it, there is some risk involved, yes. So it really, I feel the best way forward really is for us to be able to get our own equipment and then we can actually utilize that uh, equipment taking the necessary precautions that we, we feel appropriate because we know um, how these systems, how, how the Tesla core systems work so well. So possibly those things could be explored Although I do feel from experience that having the right equipment in the lab and being, uh, uh, for us being able to use it ourselves and know how to use it and choose when we use it is, is, is usually the best way forward, I would say. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, reject any conversation, of course, over those things. That's what I would say. I don't know, Aaron, what would, how do you feel about this? I communicated with somebody who had a YouTube channel with a big following. I don't know if what the username was, but I contacted him in the past about the plasma ignition stuff mm -hmm. because uh, my camera I got, I think, has 160 something frames a second or something, and it's so fast you, you can't really, you know, do, do much. Yep, and, yep. and that guy said he, w uh, he was interested in maybe doing something with it, and uh, then all the conversation stopped. But something like that, there's, there's a handful of people doing those interesting slow motion videos, and I think. Uh, there's a few of them who have uh, quite a bit faster than 10,000 frames per second. You know, I mean, there's a camera that does, what, one trillion frames per second? You see that with the pulse of light going, you can actually see the pulse of light moving 10, or yeah, one trillion frames per second. 
mean, imagine if those people could. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the difficulty often is that the that the resolution is very poor for those very fast frame frame rates. So you know, you come down to like a 64 by 64 pixel size. But the one thing I want to point out is the the engineering of this particular formation has only begun. So right now, it's in a very crude level. I had taken it to a much higher level at the RCA station in Bolinas, which now we're trying to duplicate with this. So the formations are going to become more engineerable and more exotic. I think I, maybe people here remember that not, you know, in my prior presentation, I talked about the musical anima, uh, what that might be like, and what kind of forms we might see, and what have you. And, and it's, just kind of dawned on me what, what the overall dynamic is here, and I kind of want to try to uh, quantify that. Uh, this is how we have fun. Uh, the, the guy that does the line work with me, you know, goes, well, why do you spend a month out in the Mojave Desert climbing poles and dragging miles of wire, and you're not getting paid? What do you get out of it? And he says, well, that's how we have fun. That's basically, this is how we have fun. You know, we all I started agree. this, uh, I think everybody here, we started it when we were like six or seven years old. When I was 14 years old, you know, I, I was at the controls of megawatt substations inside buildings with giant transformers and what have you, and, and, and it was fascinating. So, so we have fun, uh, and that sounds selfish, but we have fun, but then the other thing is, is our fun provides you with entertainment. That's why you're here. <laughs> so, so essentially, we are entertainers. So, so we get to have our fun because you're entertained and then you're willing to pay the box office fee <laughs> to get some more entertainment next month. But there's also another, another situation with this, which I touched on in, in the music of Bach. Uh, today, music is just a vulgar expression, usually designed to irritate as many people as you can, like a Harley Devilson motorcycle. It's just simply there to irritate or to give you the means to, be I believe, what is called twerk. <laughs> 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 but uh, but, that, but I pointed out that's not what music's about, and it's not really entertainment. Bach did not write music for entertainment. In fact, there was a slogan on his organ that said, to the glory of God. Now, one thing I know about, about my intensive study of Bach's music and my intensive exposure to Bach, Bach music and exposure to Bach music during the right cosmic intervals when it is most effective is, uh, okay, it's music. Most people, you know, it's, uh, after Bach, music was basically written to drown out the sounds of you slurping your soup. But now, you know, now it's gotten worse. But back then, it had a transformational power. And what I learned early on when I got into this under the right circumstances, you just don't sit down and listen to it, you know, and then, and then go away and, oh, well, that's all fine and dandy and whatever, because it's way too complicated. What I tried to do in my presentation was, was give enough experience so that you could listen to the music and start to grasp it. But after, what I found is after a certain number of listenings and the right cosmic polarities of planets and sunspots and all that, all of a sudden it grabs you and you'll never be the same again, ever. So in our having fun and your desire to be entertained, uh, this entertainment can have some extremely powerful transformational properties. So I just want to kind of uh, lay out that dynamic here and cut out a lot of the romanticism and capitalism and communism or whatever. But this is, this is what's going on. This is why we're all here right now. Thank you, Eric. Anyone else have a perspective on the value of having fun? I no, I think Eric said it very well, to be <laughs> honest. Yeah. We're just having yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> There's nothing more to say with you. Well, the metaphysical that. viewpoint is you're putting out good vibrations. Yeah. And like, why do you like climbing mountains? Or did you just do it. Why do you like swimming? It just yeah. You're drawn to something. It doesn't... Please. How much time do we have left? About 14 minutes. You don't have a choice. You're drawn to it. Uh, I just want to say, just having fun a lot of times is how discoveries are born and how the world has changed. So it's okay to just have fun and change the world, if, if maybe change the world. So, so. Well, discovery is the byproduct yeah. in some yeah. cases. Yeah, and having fun is the driver to... 
Yeah. I like it. It's expressing oneself. How about, how about way some of expressing. Ed, edutainment, E-D-U, -E edutainment. I, can I share, I, um, if you want to know about John Trump and his interest in electrostatics and what happened with him and the FBI and all that wonderful stuff. And it's fun to read and it's an amazing book, Mark Cipher, Tesla, Wizard at War, The Genius, The Particle Beam Weapon, and The Pursuit of Power. And John Trump, he's in there. Thank you. Mark Cypher's books, Biographies of Tesla. Yeah. Um. I have one that's kind of an open question that fits for everybody, which is, what's your plan for the next year? You start. <laughs> uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm working with the rotary electrostatic converter, the, the Trump motor, and you can see while it's not quite finished, we have all the mechanics there, it's 90% finished, so the next you know, couple few months we'll probably have it going, and uh, even in the next couple days we might have it hooked up to uh, Jeremiah's turbine. So, you know, it's right on the cusp, and it's you know all there, there's no secrets, everything's there, open to build, and what I like is it's... Uh, it's more mechanical than it is electrical because a lot of times the mechanical engineering is a lot more visual and it's a lot more intuitive. So it's, if, if I were to show you a schematic or a circuit, there wouldn't be a lot of people that could understand that. But when you see the little cutaway diagram of a reciprocating engine, you can see the combustion and the expansion all in a very visual way that uh, a lot of times electrical engineering doesn't directly provide. It needs to be endorsed, inducted into it. I intend to continue having a lot of fun. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Aaron? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I like, well, I, no, I like to work hard and I like to play hard. That's why I was uh, playing pool all night and I didn't get home until about 1.30 to 2 o'clock this morning. But uh, I want to see, in the next year, I want to see the uh, uh, RF rack 100% uh, completed. Uh, um, I'd like to see them working to get, you know, each one can be used individually or together. I'd like to see the server rack, which will be a test rack, also completed, um, and see the diff the multiple experiments that we can do with those, um, at least at some level. You know, the Trump motor, if we can run it, even if it goes, just to kind of get that, get that going, I want to see the water experiment going uh, over the next year. It's going to come soon, sooner rather than later, I believe, this water technology is uh, completed in final form and hopefully uh, by the fall we're taking uh, pre-orders for that as well um, and the same with the uh, Tesla turbine. Uh, by fall I hope to be able to uh, be taking uh, pre-orders for that as well. That, that's where, where, where it will be. Um, as far as uh, you know, conference planning and stuff like that, I usually start that around October, November. Um, not too excited about organizing the conference. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. I like what comes out of it and everything. Um, I tend to do too much myself. I'm not the best business manager to get the team delegated and do a lot of that stuff that where I can focus on more of the creative stuff. But uh, uh, I'm here pretty quick, going to be uh, brainstorming with somebody who's interested in helping me maybe transform the conference a little bit in, in a way uh, where if we do this next year, it may be people with different technologies and people with the financial means to be able to move those forward. You're using the bad, the bad word, you know. Did I say technologies? Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, There's got to be something else in the world other than technology. Products. Grounding in it. Products. Uh, depending on what they are, you know, and, and we'll be picky because, you know, I'm not interested in, uh, you know, the next little mu music player or video thing, you know, the digital stuff and whatever. But but my interest mainly is these survival technologies, things that we're going to be able to start using like this, the Tesla turbine, and hopefully uh, we are able to use them and they're not just used to rebuild after the big crash because uh, uh, things are about to fall, fall out from under our feet. Well, maybe the replacement for technology is services. Mm -hmm. I like that. Being of service. 
being a service to all life. See, because I, I, you know, my background is public utilities. Yeah. And the public utility that is my interest is the uh, seismic warning and that type of stuff, but uh, nobody's interested in that. But there's, so there's an entertainment value called the musical seismograph. So I have the means, I don't have the, the how would you say, I don't have the funds to put this stuff together or the back, back or the, the backup, but I have all the parts, uh, I have the facilities, I have the right of ways and everything to, uh, if I can't do it one way, I'll do it another way, this thing called the musical seismograph, which enables you with the stereo system to basically sit in between speakers and be inside the earth and hear the entire seismic dynamic of the earth. Is, is what I'm looking at is the earth as a musical instrument. And then if, it, if that is provided as a service uh, and people pay for it for entertainment, well, then that helps keep the thing on the air. You see what I mean? That right now, to me, that's the most important project. I want to hear what this thing sounds like. I already know what the earth stereo sounds like because I did that at Sonoma State with the RCA equipment where you use the earth as a concert hall. And uh, it's, there's no words to describe it what happens. The instruments start floating around in the room and then if there's like a solar flare or whatever, they all start jumping around and <laughs> things get wild. And there's no words to describe it. Mm -hmm. But uh, unfortunately it takes uh, two antennas, five acres big and they gotta be away from everything digital because of the China jammers that are built into all the technology, the poison of our society is every element that you buy has a little electronic Trojan horse in it. And the purpose of that is to jam out radio and make it so that you can no longer be electrically connected to the environment. And in fact, it poisons it. And I do have the, uh, I've had, I have the last RCA SSB R3 receivers, which is the piece of equipment to do this. It's a receiver that weighs 1,200 pounds and uses something like 200 vacuum tubes. And that, that's the device to do this. Basically, what it is, is is I usually, well, pretty short way is pretty much gone, so the sending end has to be built again because part of digital, digital is totalitarian. Mm -hmm. So what it does is it takes away, you don't have an uh, alternate anymore. There's no radio stations, nobody talks on the CB, no countries have shortwave stations anymore because digital is totalitarian, it's taking all that away and it's disappeared. But back in my day, every, in fact, I still get them uh, on the PRC 47 in my car once in a while, you'll get some music station in some country that you couldn't pronounce the name of, and they played this absolutely crazy, wild music. Uh, there was one out of Greece for years, but that's off the air now. And that signal comes in, and then you have, uh, the antennas are like ears, and you, you receive that in stereo. And then what the receiver does is those wavelengths and what have you, your body can't, your ears can't perceive, but the receiver translates that. And then you put on the headphones and then all of a sudden you hit the earth, the sphere of the earth with the outer and inner boundaries literally becomes a concert hall with all the reverberations and disturbances. And it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and like I say, I have most of the materials, but I don't have the place to set it up and the encroaching digital disease is making it harder and harder to find a place that it isn't jammed out. Well, any philanthropist that ever watched this video, consider that this musical seismograph, um, it sounds like an experience of awe and wonder that if enough people could experience something like that, it could just help raise the level. Um, we, we need all these services to help transform our society. You know, Stephen has a question. Yeah, the music of the spheres. Literally. I mean, yeah, this, I mean, all of this stuff points to the sublime, to the esoteric. It's so wonderful. And that all is embodied in our, in our, in this receiver right here. It's incredible. I, I, I you know, way back at the beginning, uh, Adrian, you started with the Toltec way. And I was wondering how people might uh, interface or how much your, uh, moving out, moving that information out into the world uh, just so that people would know how to interface with your organization because I, I don't understand, how, you know, what you st what the organization stands for uh, pointing to the esoteric. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's a good question. Thank you, Stephen. Mm -hmm. the, um, 
really my approach for this has been gradually to uh, draw the two together through, through the work that I've been doing. So the, so the foundation is orientated towards bringing together the esoteric and bringing together what we would call science um, or other uh, uh, disciplines, the, the main disciplines um, or endeavors that we do um, in our day-to-day -day life. So, and that has to be done gradually. I mean, there is the essence of the process at the moment that um, spirituality and I'll call it science for the moment were, were split some t uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, they were split for a reason, in order to gain more clarity about each. But there is a process now, there is an essence, a vibration of those things being drawn back together. They need to draw back together. And so finding the expression of that within the work that we're doing, within the experiments that we're doing, that's why I do the experiments in the theme of the wheel work of nature. So in other words, looking for those fundamental principles that will gradually allow the two to draw together. And it can't be forced together. It was what I was saying about the fusion process. You can't force atoms together and get fusion. It doesn't work that way. So gradually drawing together the two, making correspondences between where one can inform the other. So the principles in the Toltec system of knowledge help to inform me and guide me into how I go about um, interpreting and working with the experiments that I'm working with and how I am part of that process. Yeah, the, the, the foundation for Toltec research. So the foundation for Toltec research is, a, is, a, uh, is an organization in its infancy. So in other words, to encourage um, humanity's endeavors from the perspective of the esoteric combined with the endeavor, with the, with the external intent of the endeavor. So I've always used that through my work. I work with a small group of people um, that also hold that, that intent, if you like. One of, the, um, pro one of the products of that was, was the laser healing, therapeutic healing device, um, which, which I included. And you can find, so that is a, a direct example of using the Toltec system of knowledge and the principles that come with it and embodying those within a product. And that's quite a mature product. That's been around for 12 years. It's lots of reviews, testimonials. Um, it's, it's made very big headway in the, in the, in the alternative approach to, uh, to healing and therapeutics. So it's quite possible to do that. And the foundation is, is something that takes on life-supportive, inclusive endeavors based underlying on the Toltec system of knowledge or the facet of the one truth with which it's interested in. That's, that's, that's the intent and purpose of the foundation. Thank you, Stephen, for asking that. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. And, and a real quick question. Okay, well, I'll make this as quick as possible. Um, first of all, this has been an amazing experience for me to come to this for the first time. And I just want to pay my respects to all of you on the panel for bringing it together, especially you, Aaron. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I don't mean any disrespect for this, but uh, I, I have to kind of push back a little bit on you, Eric, with regard to your objection to the, wor wor the use of the word technology, because <coughs> if I'm understanding the definition properly, it is simply the practical application of technology, of, of science, of knowledge. So it's a matter of, the knowledge is extremely important, that's the foundation. But if we don't apply it, if we don't do anything with it, then it has no value to the world. So knowledge is a head thing. It's a, it, it, we need to go beyond that, and it's, but it's fundamental. So that's what I just wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, we're out of time, and I want to thank Adrian Hockessays, Aaron, Eric, and Griffin for this stimulating discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim.